All right, we're going to take a look at um, section 1.2. Um, this part is on the graphing calculator and basically setting a window that allows you to see everything in the graph that's important. Okay, so we'll start with that. So we're going to do a problem uh, in a minute. And the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of give you a general idea of how to think about solving problems. Okay, really, any, any kind of problem. It's not specific to this one. So the first thing is when you read the problem, you really have to determine two things. One, what do I get from reading the problem? What, what are they giving me? And two, what is it that they actually want me to figure out? If you don't know what a question is asking you to do, then I mean, you're not going to be able to solve it. So once you know, or once you kind of organize the information that they give you, and then you figure out, okay, this is what I need to find. Well, then you have to figure out some kind of plan for solving that problem. So one type of plan might be to draw a picture. That's how I approached the trisecting a line segment. I, I didn't think of it as a formula. I thought of it as a, as a visual. So making a picture. Um, you might also, for example, if I said to you, give me all the ways you can arrange the letters A, B, and C. What might you do if you wanted to figure out every way you could arrange an A, a B, and a C? Yeah. You make a list. Yeah, you might make a list. That's not too bad because there's probably only six ways you can do it. But if I said, tell me all the ways you can arrange the letters A through K, well, you don't want to make a list for that. It's probably thousands and millions. So uh, lists aren't always practical if they get too big. And what's another thing you'd use a lot in math? Like if you wanted to find like the volume of something or the area, what are you going to need to do something like that? Yeah? Formula. Right, you may need an equation or a formula. And then you have to solve that equation or formula. So once you pick which method you're going you're gonna to go with, then you carry out that method. So that means, okay, make your sketch. Or sometimes it's making a sketch and then using a formula app. Sometimes it's both. For the problem we're going to do next, it's just going to involve making a uh, formula, so solving an equation. Okay. Questions on those just kind of very, very general steps? So here's our situation. Uh, somebody's going to be renting a car, and it costs $15 to rent the car plus 20 cents for every mile. Now, when we write um, an equation, we're going to need to figure out how many variables are there. Can anyone have a guess how many variables we're going to need to write this equation? Yeah? One. Um, well, what's one thing that we may not know in this problem? Like if somebody just said, oh, I rented a car. Okay. Well, based on a, what's up here, what's something you might ask, or something they, well, yeah, something you would you might want to know, yeah? Like how many miles they drove? Okay, so how many miles did you drive the car? That, that's something. And depending on how many miles you drive, that's going to control what? Yeah? Total cost. The total cost. So there's two things happening. There's cost, and then there's mileage. So... We need to pick two letters. A lot of times when we write an equation with two letters, um, two most common letters we might use in um, algebra would be what? Yes? X and Y. X and Y, especially when we're graphing. And it really, um, it really isn't a choice which one is which. We're going to learn this a little bit later, but X is your independent variable, Y is your dependent. Does anyone think they know which one here is the independent variable? Yep. Like how many miles? Yes. How many miles you drive is independent, and that's always your x. So miles is x. The cost depends on how many miles you drive. So you could say cost is dependent on mileage. Anything that is dependent on something else is always a line value, always. Cost 
depends on the divine nature. Right. So let's write our equation. So what would be an equation that represents total cost? So what I'm saying is I want total cost by itself. Yeah, uh, Matt? Um, y equals 0.2x plus 15. Y equals 0.2x plus 15. Perfect. That is an equation that represents finding the cost depending on how many miles you've done. Questions on the equation? Now let's use that equation to figure out the cost if we were to drive 50 miles. How am I going to use my formula to get the cost for 50 miles? What can I do? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to plug in 50 for x. So y equals 0 0.2, fill in 50 for x, plus 15. Now 0.2 times 50, 0.2 is 1 fifth, if you want to think of that as a fraction. So what's 1 fifth of 50? Uh, Bruce? Um, 10, and then plus 15. 25. 25, and what did we just find? 25 what? The amount of the cost. Of the right, the amount of the cost, so that's 25 dollars. So there's your, your cost for 50. How about the cost for 100? Double the miles, can we just double the cost? Say, oh, 50 miles is 25, 100 would be 50. Now, why, why can't we just double it? Yeah, go ahead. Because um, uh, you're only paying the initial cost once, yeah. so the 15. Yeah, you only pay that 15 once. So we can't double the 15 part. You can double the mileage part of the cost, but not the 15. So that would be y equals 0 0.2 times 100 plus 15. And that's going to give me a cost of how much? $35. So that's using a formula and then plugging in a value to figure out the cost. Any questions on that? Okay, so that formula is called the algebraic representation of our problem. So if they ever ask you to find an algebraic representation for a problem, they basically mean write an equation that represents your situation. Okay, let's use that formula one more time, but let's do the reverse of what we just did. Let's say that Sarah paid $50 to rent the car. How many miles did she drive? So what would we do with the 50 this time? Uh, you plug it in for y. Right, we're plugging in for y. So this isn't plugging in for x and then really just doing arithmetic. This is now doing algebra. We're going to get the variable by itself. Okay, it's a little different. So we're going to plug in 50 right there. So 50 equals 0.2x plus 15. And my first step to solve for x would be, Bruce? Subtract 15. Subtract 15. All right. And this is only a two-step equation, so now my last step. Um, what am I doing? Uh, this is supposed to be 35. Um, what's my last last thing? Yep. yep. Divide both sides by 0. 0.2. And dividing by 0. 0.2, that means dividing by a fifth, which is really multiplying by 5. So what is x? Seven. Um, you're not dividing by 5, you're dividing by 1 fifth. If you did 35 divided by 5, you would get 7. But this is 35 divided by 1 
bit of it. So it's actually like 35 times 5. 175. 175. And that's probably the quickest way to solve it, using algebra to just a two-step equation. Now I'm going to show you a different way on the calculator. So on the calculator, well, first thing we need to do is turn it on. If you have anything on the screen, you can just clear it. It doesn't really matter. You can leave it there if you want. But we need to press the button we pressed yesterday to type in a graph. Um, does anybody remember what that button was? Yeah. Um, the Y equals button. The Y equals button. <laughs> If you've got something already there, we got to clear it out because we're going to type in our own thing. We're actually going to type in two things. We're going to type this in for y1, and we're going to type this for y2. So we're still going to be looking for where two things that are equal, but we're going to draw a picture, and then we're going to draw another picture. And we're going to see where those two pictures are equal. So think about what that would mean if you're going to look where two pictures are equal. So let's put 50 on y1 and put 0.2x plus 15 on y2. So what do you think that means? I'm going to draw those two pictures, which they're both lines, and I'm going to see where they're equal. So what do you think I'm really going to be looking for? Yeah. A point where the lines cross. Yeah, I'm gonna look where they intersect. Now, this top one is the line y equals 50. That's gonna be a line at 50. So our standard window, does anybody remember how high the standard window goes? 10. That's not high enough. So what do you think I should set my y max to? Yeah. Yeah, I go a little above fifty, just so it's not on the edge of the screen. You could do like fifty-five. That would, well, y max. So that would be fifty-five. Now, why was the amount of money we pay to rent the car? Well, could you pay negative ten dollars? No. Did, what kind of numbers wouldn't make sense at all if you're paying to rent a car? No what? Yeah, you can't, in fact, we can't even pay less than $15, really, but we definitely don't want to pay negatives. So I would set the Y min at zero. Now, X is the number of miles we drive. What number of miles would not make sense in this problem at all? Uh, you could drive zero miles. You just it means you basically pay $15. Maybe that was the fee to reserve the car, but you didn't drive it at all. But we definitely can't drive. Yeah. Or less than that, negative. Yeah, we can't drive negative miles. So it doesn't make sense to look at anything under zero. So let's have zero be the starting point. Now, we already know how many miles it's going to take, or for whatever it was, how many miles she drove. How many miles was it? 175. 175. So we know 10 is not enough. But let's pretend we didn't know that. Let's just hit graph. There's your line at 50, and there's your line with a slope of 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is not a very steep slope. It's going to go up really slow. So which direction do I need to look further in if I want to see where these cross? Yep. I need to look further to the right. And which value here represents further to the right? X max. And we already know it's at 175. So we may just have to guess a couple times to, to see it. But let's do 200. And if you do 200, you should be able to see them intersect. Um, I keep coming up with an error. Uh, with an error? Um, so let's go here. There you go. It was um, something somebody did in the last class. All right, so now we, anyone else uh, getting an error? Okay. So we want to see where those intersect. So I want to find exactly 
Where is that point? Well, calculator can do that if you press second and then calc. And based on the options that you have there, which one do you think it would be? Yep. Five. Five. So intersect. So we're going to press five. That's going to ask you three questions. The first question it's going to ask you is, what is the first line that you want to use, then the second line you want to use? So the first line I want to use is the blue one. So I'm just going to hit enter because it's on the blue one already. The second line I want to use is the red one. So I'm going to hit enter. And you might think, well, why does it ask you which two you want to use? There's only two on the screen. Well, there could be up to 10 on the screen. Remember, you can draw 10 things at a time. So you'd have to tell the calculator which two you want to use. It, it is kind of pointless when there's only two. We pick the red and the blue. And the third thing is the guess. So the guess doesn't really matter because these lines only cross in one spot. If you're like, well, when, when would it cross in two spots? Well, if you had something more like this, and you want to find both those intersections, you can't do them at the same time. You have to do one at a time. And the way that you tell the calculator what intersection you want to find is the guess. You move it close to the intersection point you're looking for, in this case, the only intersection point, and then you hit enter, and it should say 175. Um, how many people got uh, 175? Good. If that intersection point is off the screen, it won't work. So you have to be able to zoom out enough to find where that intersection point is. Any questions on that? So that's how you can calculate. And you can, you can do it, um, like maybe you have a shape like this. And you draw a line like that. You may have it cross three times. Well, you can do second calc three times, and you can find all of them. But you do have to do them one at a time. With lines, that, that's the easiest case. So when you find a screen that basically shows everything that's important, that's called a complete graph. That's a complete graph. It shows everything I need to see about those two equations that's important. The main thing is where they cross. So if you see a question on the homework that says, uh, here's, a, here's a problem, find a complete graph. All you have to do is write down the window. What would you write down when you write down the window? You would write down. Oh, I like how it does that. You just write down. X min, the X max. And then the Y min and the Y max. That's your window. And there isn't necessarily one right answer for the window. There definitely can be more than one answer. Like if you did your X max at 210, yeah, that's fine. If you did your x max at 100, that's not fine because you wouldn't see 175, and that's what you needed to see. So, any questions on what I mean by a complete graph? Let's try another one. I think we did the, this graph yesterday. Um, so, I'm not going to find a complete graph for it, but did, did we do one where we did x squared and then plus a number? Okay. Does anybody remember what kind of graph or what, what the shape was called? Yep. Parabola. Yep. That's a parabola. So I would just write that down if you don't know that. But that's called a parabola. And that's a, that's a pretty simple parabola. It can be a, a little bit more complicated. That's how it, parabolas look in general. AX squared plus BX plus C. 
That's called the general form of a parabola, or a quadratic equation. If you write down something like y equals x squared plus 10, it, it's basically that. You're just letting b be 0, so the middle part's gone. You're letting c be 10, and you're letting a be 1. So it's, that's a pretty simple one. And depending on how you change a, b, and c, positives and negatives, you can make the parabola look different. You can open up, you can open down, you can be kind of wider like that. Oh, we'll talk about how changing those values affects it at some point. Let's try this one. Let's try to find a complete graph of the square root of x plus 20. Well, before we even do anything on the calculator, um, if we're dealing with Algebra 1 kind of numbers, real numbers, what are you not allowed to take the square root of? You, you can't do this. You cannot take the square root of certain kinds of numbers. Yeah? Just uh, Well, we're talking about specific numbers. Specific numbers you can't use. Uh, Dylan? Uh, negative numbers. Yeah, you can't take the square root of a negative. Otherwise, it would be imaginary. We're sticking with real numbers. Uh, can you do zero? Think. Is it, can you multiply two numbers together and get zero? That are the same? Yeah, what? Zero. Zero times zero. So yeah, a lot of people think you can, well, you can't do the square root of zero. The square root of zero is fine, but you can't do the square root of negatives. So that means that you want this to always satisfy this condition. You want x plus 20 to always be above or equal to zero. So what does that mean about x? You want x to always be above or equal to what number? Yeah. Mm, you can go lower than zero. Like if you plug negative one in here, that's fine. Because negative one plus 20 is 19. And you can take the square root of 19. So we can go lower than zero for x. How low can we go? Yeah. Negative we can go as low as negative 20. And the reason why I did that is because when we start to set our window, we need to keep that number in mind. Okay, we don't, I mean, we might go a little past negative 20 just to see it, but there's no reason to go to like negative 100 or something. It doesn't, it doesn't go that far because numbers that are that small can't be plugged into that formula. All right, so now we're ready to graph it and um, see what happens. So let's turn it on. Go back to y equals. Clear out anything that's there. And if you're seeing random dots kind of on the screen, I just thought of it in the last class, it's probably because your plot one is highlighted in black. Okay. If it's highlighted in black and you don't want to see random dots that were coming up on the screen, if you press the up arrow and hit enter, it'll make it not highlighted anymore. If the random dots don't bug you, then just leave them. All right, so square root. Um, you press second, and then you press the x squared button. That's the fifth button down on the left. And then x plus 20. OK, now before I hit graph, anytime before I hit graph, I always want to Check my what? what? Do I have to check? Yep. Yeah. I have to check the window and make sure that that's set correctly. All right, so we have to go lower than zero, but we don't have to go that much past negative twenty. So let's do negative twenty-five. Now, if we want to do an x max of 200, that's fine. But now we have to think about, well, how high would the graph be on the y-axis if we did that? If you put in 200 for x, you're going to get square root of 220, which is pretty close to what number? <clears throat> Roughly, yeah? 
Square root of two twenty-five. Yeah, it's close to the square root of two twenty-five. It's a little smaller, and the square root of two twenty-five would be how much? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, fifteen. Fifteen. So the square root of two hundred and twenty is about fifteen. It's a little smaller. So on the y-axis, we need to go up to at least fifteen, or the graph is going to go off the screen. Now, when we take a square root, this symbol by definition means it's a positive answer. If they want the negative answer, you would see something like this in front of them, like a plus and a minus symbol. When that symbol's not there, they want the positive answer. Yeah? When I try going down, it just says errors. And... When you try going down? Yeah, like when I try to look um, that's because you need to put in a negative sign, not a subtraction sign. Oh, okay. So remember, when you type in a negative number, uh, the number you want to use, or the button you want to use, right below the three. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so why, what did I just say? Y max 15? Yeah, and why min? i go with go with zero, because square root's never going to give you a negative answer. Okay, so I just I said something wrong. Um, let's see. Um, oh yeah, what did I set wrong? Yeah. You swap the line max. And yeah, I swap the line max and min, which yeah. usually happens if I'm talking and trying to do this at the same time. Okay, and there is your graph. And if you're wondering, does it does it go lower? Uh, no. You could set the y min lower if you want to check, but it does start right from the axis and curve that way. Yeah. Uh, you get an error. You get an error? All right, let's see. What do you got? Uh, error you know, dimension. So you probably want to shut that scatter plot off that I mentioned earlier. Just turn that off. And that goes out. Well, once you set your window, you should be nice. And what does that kind of look like? That is the graph of a square root function, but does anyone see what it kind of looks like? Half of a problem. That's what a square root function is. It's half of a problem. So what was the actual question? Find a complete uh, find a complete graph. All right, so we found it. And here's your answer. Just write down those values. Oh, I grabbed it before it finished. So x min, x max. And y min, y max. Um, what did I do for y max? 15. And that's how you write down a window. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to show you is probably what was messing um, some of you up. You were getting, getting that kind of weird error. Um, and that's how you can graph um, data points. Okay, or how you can put like individual points in on the calculator and then just graph them. We're not going to do a lot with graphing them. I'm just going to show you how to put points in, and later on we'll do something with them. Okay, those those are the points we're going to put in. Okay, so how do you do it? Let me show you. There's probably going to be some numbers that are already in there. So, in fact, well, we'll do the same numbers. I was going to change them, but we'll do the same ones. To put in points that you want to graph, the first thing it says to do is press the stat button, which is right below delete at the top, and then go to edit. So if you press stat, the first thing that it says under option one is edit. Now, I kind of want to leave those numbers because they're the ones we're going to use, but let's pretend like we didn't have numbers. 
or somebody had numbers in there before you and you got to get rid of them. If you press delete, when the number is highlighted, it will delete it. If you don't have a number highlighted and you press delete, it doesn't do anything. So you have to make sure you highlight a number and press delete. And I could do the same for my X's. I'll just start from scratch. Okay, now I don't have anything typed in. Any question on just getting to a screen where nothing's typed in like that? Now you don't have to do it this way, but this is the way I would recommend because of what we're going to do next. I would take the X values and put them in where it says L1. That's the first list. And I would put the Y values in the second list. So let's put those in. It's easier to do the X's first because every time you hit enter, it's just going to move you down. So negative 3, negative 2. Make sure you're using the correct button for a negative. And now to type in L2, you press the right arrow, and now you type in those. It is important that you have the same number of items in L1 and L2. If you're missing one, that's like writing an X value without a Y. It's like leaving Y blank. You can't do that. And if you try, you'll get an error. Right, so put that in. So any question on getting that list of numbers typed in? Okay, so we're, we're done with that. The numbers are all typed in. So now you can press second, quit, second, mode. It just gets you out of that screen. Now we want to graph. Okay. There's two things we have to do when we want to graph. One, we have to tell the calculator what we want to graph. And two, we have to check the window. So usually the way we tell the calculator we want to graph something is we press y equals and we type in a formula. But we're not graphing a formula, we're graphing a table. We're still going to go to the y equals screen now. If there's anything else in there, you can get rid of it. If you leave it, it's going to be on top of the, the scatter plot. We really don't want it there. Now, the calculator can do three scatter plots at a time. We need to turn one of them on. So I'm going to press the up arrow. And we're going to hit enter on plot one. You probably could do two or three. It wouldn't matter which one you do. So by turning plot one on, we now told the calculator what we want to graph. Now we need to check our window. Looking at that table, what's the biggest, what's the smallest, and what's the biggest x value? Yeah. Negative three and three. So I would not do negative 25 and 200. I would probably do negative 5 and 5. Okay. What about the smallest and the biggest y value? Yeah. So what do you think some good values would be for the min and max there? Yeah, I do negative 20 and 20. So now, put in what you want to graph. You set the window. Press graph. And you should see a set of points that look like that shape. Okay. Um, how many people got a set of points that looked like that shape? Okay, a lot of people did. Um, did anybody not get a set of points that look like that? Yeah? What'd you get? Um, so go to staff. Let me see. It might be something somebody did in the last class. 
Um, let me just check. So you typed all your numbers in perfect. Um, it's probably... Yep, I see what somebody did. They changed something that I would help you fix. So you did everything fine. If you get to something like that, it's because it's something you didn't know, and I would fix it for you. But yeah, it was, you're fine now. Um, anyone else? Yeah? Okay, so that's a, yours is set to do a box and whisker plot. So you can do all kinds of plots. What we have to do is go in and change the type of plot. I would help you do that as well. Um, because we're not gonna do like box and whisker plots. We don't really do anything super fancy with it. So rather than teach you all that, I'll help you fix it. Um, but, you didn't have the same number of X's in L1 and L2. If you scroll down on this list, mm -hmm. there's actually an extra number there that you don't want. So you want to delete that number okay. by pressing delete. Uh, at the top. And then hit graph, and now it's going to be okay. Perfect. Yep. So there's a lot of different settings on the calculator, and sometimes somebody could have changed something that affects what you're doing, but it's like a setting that you didn't learn about. So I'll, I'll help you with that. Okay, any other questions on, on that? Okay, now what we're gonna do just so the next person that uses it doesn't have to see a scatter plot, is you're just gonna press Y equals, go up to plot one, hit enter, and now we turn the scatter plot off we can leave the data in there, but if you hit graph now, you won't see it. Okay, because we shut the scattered plot off. The data will stay in there until you reset the calculator. Like if you tick batteries out or something like that. Okay. Um, I didn't show you. We, we did the last two steps, I just didn't show them to you. Uh, so you press window, and we set the window, and then we finished up by pressing graph. Questions on that? All right, so let's take a look at the, the last thing, which is a little bit of 1.3, which is on functions. So in this equation, this was the rent-a-car equation that we did in the last section. Um, what do we call the x variable again? I mean, you can call it the x variable, but there's another name. Yeah? Independent. Independent. There's also another name for it that begins with a D. Yeah? Domain. What did we call the Y? Yeah? Dependent. Dependent. Um, there's another name for that one that goes with domain. It's not domain, it's the, the range. And we already said all those. So you can kind of think of the domain or the x value is what you, the number you plug into a formula, and the y value is the answer that you get when you plug in a value. So if I plug in 10, that would be the input for x, and the output would be 17. If I plug in 10 and do the arithmetic out. So just different different names for x and y. Now, not every picture that you draw on the calculator is a function. Okay, a function is, is something special. Does anybody know what test um, a graph has to pass to be a function? Yeah, that new one. Uh, the right, vertical line tests. And what, what the vertical line test basically means is that, that you plug in a number for x, you get exactly one answer for y. That's what makes something a function. You plug in a number for x, and you get exactly one answer for y. What's, a, what's something that's not a function? Well, this. If I plug into that 
equation I just wrote down. If I plug in 25 for x, what do I get for y? Yeah, um, was it? Five and negative five. Five and negative five. That is not one answer. He gave me two. So if you plug a number into a formula and you get two answers, that's not a function. You have to only get one answer. And another name for that is the vertical line test. But that's what the vertical line test means. Uh, don't worry about that. Let's, uh, let's worry about that. Um, I kind of already said this. Domain is another word for input. Range is another word for output. But I did add a word there. I said valid. Because if you had a formula like this, you cannot plug any number you want in for x. There is a number that won't work there. What, what can you plug in here? Yeah? Any positive number? Oh, I, I think every number besides zero. Yeah, every, the range, what we say here is the domain is all numbers except zero. So those are the valid numbers you can plug in. Um, if you had something like this, I would say the domain there is any number from negative 2 and up. You can't plug in numbers below negative 2. If you do, it's going to give you um, an error. Okay. So the only two types of equations you have to be careful with the domain is equations that have variables in the bottom. You never want to end up plugging a zero in the bottom. And you also never want to end up taking the square root of a negative. So square roots and fractions. Those are the two we got to be careful. Generally, we're going to be focusing on real numbers. So unless otherwise stated, the domain has to be a real number. What other kind of numbers are there? There's complex, but we're not we're not doing complex right now. So there's two different ways to write the equation that we had in the last section. One of the top one is the way we did it. The bottom one is a different notation. Um, does anybody know how you pronounce that? It's um it's not like f parentheses x. You don't you don't say it that way. Yep, so we have f of x. Right, that means f of x. That's called function notation, when you just replace the y with f of x. Again, something you, you did back in algebra 1, but I um, want to make sure people remember what that's called. Any question on that? Okay. Um, all right, let me try this one. Let's find a complete graph of the square root of x minus 3. Well, first step is type it in. And before we hit graph, we always need to check. Yep, we need to check the window. Okay, uh, when we go to window, mm, can't plug in numbers as low as negative 5. Negative 5 minus 3 is negative 8. You can't take the square root of negative 8. What's the smallest x value you could plug in to that problem? Yeah. 3. You can't go lower than 3. So I wouldn't go any lower than 3. How high can you go? Well, there's no limit. You can go as high as you want. Let's go up to 100. And when you see this symbol, square root, remember it means the answer is always going to be what kind of number? Positive. Positive. So it doesn't even make sense to look at negative answers. Now think about if you had 100 right here. 100 minus 3 is 97. The square root of 97 is about what, roughly? Less than 10. A little less than 10. So I think if you set your y max at 10, you should be good. 
And you don't even have to really graph it if you feel comfortable. But that's what the graph looks like. I would say, yeah, that's a good graph. Looks like a parabola on its on its side. And for the window, okay, write down those mins and maxes. Yeah, are those the only mins and maxes? No. Uh, but I would say if you set like x max to a million, I mean that's probably going to be way too big. You probably could have done two hundred. Yeah. So what was the lowest x value that we were allowed to pick? Three. This is the domain. And what was the highest x value we could theoretically pick? Yeah. You can go as high as you want. There's no limit to how high of a square root you can take. So how do you represent going as high as you want? In that. Yeah. So your uh, gradient is um, It is a symbol, not any equality though. Yep. Infinity. Infinity. So that's the lowest we can go. That's the highest we can go. Put a comma between them. Now, can you ever reach infinity? No. If you can't reach something, it's kind of like an open circle. We don't include open circle. We don't include when we put a parenthesis on something. Now, can you reach three? Like, could you plug three in for x here and it would be okay? Do you remember what symbol we use when you can include something? Sometimes we use the closed circle, but I showed you another symbol. Yeah? The bracket. The bracket. That's how you write the domain in this problem. That's how low you can go. That's how high you can go. Parenthesis means you can't reach it. You can never reach infinity. And three means you can reach it. Now let's graph it again and just look at it. What's the? That's how far left and right the graph goes. But how about up and down? What's the lowest that it looks like the graph goes? And if you want to see it a little differently, I can do zoom six. What's the lowest that it that it ever goes? Yeah? Zero. Zero. What's the highest that that curve is going to go? Well, yeah, it's just going to keep curving up. I mean, it's going to be slow, but it's going to kind of do something like this. It's never going to level off. It's, it's just going to keep curving up slowly. So the highest it goes is infinity. Uh, can we reach infinity? No, we can never reach it. Will we reach zero on that graph? Yeah, plug in three. 3 minus 3 is 0, and then the square root of 0 is 0. So yeah, you do reach 0. We're going to talk a lot about this notation. So for now, if you just said x is greater than or equal to 3, I would accept that. That's the domain, all numbers greater than or equal to 3. And the range is all numbers greater than or equal to 0. I, I would accept that. This is better. What's on the left? Um, yeah. It takes a little practice to get good with domain and range, but the graphing calculator helps a lot because you can see it. All right, so what does it mean to evaluate? So you're going to see evaluate when you write something in function notation. And you might see something like this. What evaluate means is to take the number that they give you inside parentheses and plug it into the formula and give me the answer. It's 
So let's um, let's try. Okay, the point is evaluated from the number. You're looking for some kind of number that's the answer. Let's just do those three. F of negative two, F of three, and F of A. So in F, of, if I want to find F of negative two, what number are they asking me to plug in? Yeah. Negative two. Negative two. And Riley, what am I going to plug in the negative two for? Okay. X. Yep. I'm going to plug it in for x in the formula they give me. That's what evaluate means. And then simplify. Um, what's negative 2 squared plus 1? 5. So that's f of negative 2. How about f of 3? If you can do it in your head, that's, that's fine. 10. 3 squared plus 1. How about f of a? Yeah. a squared plus 1. You can't really simplify it, it's just plug in a. a squared plus 1. And that's what it means to evaluate. Any questions on that? Uh, so the last thing, which we kind of already mentioned, is not everything, not everything that you draw on the calculator is a function. This one in particular would look like this. It'd be a square root function, but because it has a plus or minus, it'd be the top and the bottom half. So there was a, a test that we said we could use if we had a picture to see if something was a function. Does anyone remember what was the name of that test? Yeah. That was the variable line test. And the idea, uh, the idea of the vertical line test is that if you have a picture and you can draw a vertical line and it hits your graph more than once, whatever you just drew a picture of is not a function. Circle vertical line. Could I put this vertical line anywhere in the circle where it would hit it more than once? Yeah, almost everywhere. Okay. If it hits more than once, it's not a function. That's it. There's a lot of different stuff in that. Those two sections, maybe finding the complete graph on the calculator and the intersection, I think that was new. But hopefully, like vertical line test, evaluate. Hopefully, you've done that before. Okay, so we usually don't have any assignment on a Friday because we would have had a test today. Um, we didn't have a test. So, page 20 uh, was the 1.2. A lot of this is on the graphing calculator. So, you may not have as much work to show on paper. And page 30, that was the beginning of what we just did on functions. Okay, so that will be due uh, 10 days from now on September 11th.